war years now. Raging war. Israel Hamas conflict rages on as humanitarian crisis in Gaza deepens. Robots on patrol. AI robots patrol the streets of South Korea for the safety of its citizens. Train chaos. Strong winds disrupt train networks in Australia, inconveniencing commuters. Ring of fire. An solar solar eclipse occurs as a moon journey in between the Earth and the Sun, creating a ring of fire. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. Good evening, you are joining us on World News this Monday night. We begin today in Afghanistan, which has been hit by a third earthquake in the space of a week. Save Children Organization says that at least four people were killed in Sunday's quake and that 150 were injured. According to the U.S. Geological Survey, the 6.3 magnitude earthquake struck near the city of Herat at a depth of 8 kilometers. Medicine Sound Frontiers says the number of deaths is unlikely to climb as people are on high alert and are sleeping outdoors. It comes after an initial earthquake the previous weekend, which the Taliban said killed more than 2,000 people, most of whom were women and children. It also flattened some villages and destroyed several homes. A second earthquake days later in the same region triggered landslides that also destroyed dozens of houses. Moving on to the updates of the Israel-Hamas war. The death toll from the armed conflict between Israel and Hamas has surpassed 4,000. Meanwhile, Israel Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu vowed to destroy the Hamas. The threat comes as residents of Gaza were given a three-hour time frame on Sunday to leave and move to the south. The death toll from the armed conflict between Israel and Hamas has surpassed 4,000 as of Sunday. The Palestinian side said the death toll from Israeli bombardment of Gaza reached at least 2,670, while Israel says more than 1,400 Israelis had been killed since fighting began over a week ago. In total, over 13,000 people on both sides have also been injured, including 9,600 in Gaza. Meanwhile, the UN peacekeeping mission in Lebanon said Sunday that its headquarters was struck by a rocket amid exchanges of fire on the border with Israel. According to the United Nations interim forces in Lebanon, a rocket shell landed on its site in southern Lebanon and they are working to identify where it originated. No casualties were reported. Meanwhile, hundreds of thousands of Gaza residents fled their homes in northern Gaza as the Israeli military opened a three-hour window from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. on Sunday, in which they said they would not conduct military operations. Israel said it would continue to allow Palestinians to flee Gaza to relocate southward. As Israel's expanded emergency cabinet met for the first time on Sunday, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu vowed that Israel is gearing up to demolish Hamas in Gaza. The ministers started off with a moment of silence for the over 1,000 Israelis killed in the recent escalations. Netanyahu said the force of unity sends a clear message to the nation, the enemy and the world. The Israeli offensive in the Gaza Strip has now reached its ninth day and the situation is growing increasingly dire for the 2.3 million civilians residing in Gaza. They are confronted with escalating challenges in securing essential necessities such as food, water and safety, all while preparing for the imminent threat of an Israeli ground invasion. Men and children, desperate for food, leaned into a bakery in Gaza as an Israeli bombardment intensified on Saturday. Drinking water was also in short supply. And power shortages left families without charged phones to find out if fleeing relatives were safe. This Gazan in Khan Yunus has been visiting a neighbor who has solar power to charge his phone. It's like going back to prior 1948, even before that. We've gone back to the Stone Age. No electricity, water, internet, nor fuel. Those who have generators that operate on fuel to provide power is pointless. There is no fuel, nor diesel, nor anything else. It is terrifying. Look at that, how many phones that are being charged. It is frightening. 
More than one million Palestinians in northern Gaza faced an Israeli deadline on Saturday to flee south, and Khan Yunus in south Gaza is filling up fast. The flood of people arriving in the south has stretched resources that were already strained to a breaking point. Many displaced Gazan took refuge in this school west of Khan Yunus. Nayem Abu Eid is one of them. He said the family felt danger was getting closer to them when they were near the Israeli border. An Israeli military spokesman said troops were amassing around the Gaza Strip, getting ready for the next stage of operations, after having already launched raids into the enclave. Israel has vowed to annihilate the Hamas militant group that controls Gaza in retaliation for a rampage by fighters who stormed through Israeli towns a week ago, gunning civilians down and taking off with scores of hostages. Some 1,300 people were killed in the worst attack on civilians in Israel's history. The United Nations has urged Israel to avert a humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza, a slither of land with 2.3 million people. Thousands of Australian commuters battled to get home as wild winds brought down trees onto tracks, crippling the train networks. Let's take a look. A mixed bag from Mother Nature. A snow dump in the middle of spring at Jindabyne. And a warning of what was to come from Nowra. In a blink, Sydney sunshine was muscled out by a hit-and-run storm. On the harbour, winds were clocked at close to 100 kilometres per hour. A bumpy ride on the water and on the roads. A ute on the M1 at Mooney Mooney could not avoid a fallen tree. Train services also took a direct hit. Trees down on the lines at Guildford and St Mary's, shutting down the western line between Blacktown and Penrith. Commuters left stranded as they waited for replacement buses. Literally look at all the people waiting. And the bushfire threat is never far away. In the state's northwest, three fires at emergency level, including near Campsie. It's been burning for days. This afternoon, the dire warning for residents of 50 properties, it's too late to leave, so take shelter. The fire west of Kempsey is actually so turbulent that they can't actually get aircraft into it because it's really erratic. So much so it's been impossible to calculate the damage, but they fear some properties have already been lost. Latest on tonight's Road to the White House now. Donald Trump's rivals for the Republican presidential nomination have a money problem that mirrors their polling problem. None of them are flush with the kind of cash that would suggest they are poised to take down a frontrunner who has more dollars, universal name recognition and an unmatched capacity to suck up media attention. Moreover, no one else in the field has built the type of small donor operation that can be tapped again and again to replenish funds. Just 4% of Trump's campaign hall came from donors who have given the maximum primary contribution of $3,300. More than 40% of Florida Governor Ron DeSantis' third quarter sum came from donors who have maxed out to the campaign. For Senator Tim Scott of South Carolina and former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley, the share from max out donors topped 30% each. The numbers mean that non-Trump candidates will rely on the support of allied supper packs, funded primarily by mega donors to pay for expensive television ads and other campaign adjacent activities. Overall, the numbers tell the story of a pack of candidates fighting one another for scraps when Trump continues to dominate national and state-by-state -state polling. He augmented those advantages by kicking his grassroots fundraising machine into overdrive this summer, turning the criminal charges he faced into successful calls for contribution, through a good chunk of that money is being used to cover his astronomical legal fees. Welcome back. Poland's right-wing populist law and justice party looks set to lose its majority in parliament following national elections. Exit polls predict that it won't have enough coalition support to remain in power. 
Instead, the centrist opposition Civic Coalition Party, with 31.6%, is more likely to form a successful political alliance with smaller parties. According to the exit polls, the party has more than 248 of the 460-seat lower house of parliament, giving it enough support to end the sitting government's eight-year rule. This year's elections also included referendums on issues such as raising the retirement age and the number of migrants allowed to enter Poland. Next, in the USA, U.S. House Republicans nominated Representative Jim Jordan of Ohio as their new nominee for Speaker of the House of Representatives. After Representative Steve Scalas abandoned his candidacy in the face of opposition from hard-right members of the GOP. U.S. Representative Jim Jordan emerged on Friday as the Republicans' second House Speaker nominee in a week. But even though closed-door votes left Jordan with the backing of a majority of House Republicans, he was still shy of the 217 votes he would need to seize the Speaker's gavel. After an initial vote in which Jordan beat out Representative Austin Scott for the nomination, the second round of voting did not result in much more support for the Ohio congressman. As lawmakers said, about one in four House Republicans cast a ballot purely against Jordan. Since Republicans control the chamber by a narrow margin, they cannot afford to lose more than four votes if Democrats vote against Jordan, as they are expected to do. Jordan, who serves as House Judiciary Committee chair, tormented Republican leaders for years as a vocal advocate for the party's right wing. He has the endorsement of former President Donald Trump. He also has the endorsement of Kevin McCarthy, who was ousted as House Speaker on October 3rd in a historic vote. Jordan narrowly lost the nomination on Wednesday to Steve Scalise, who was seen as the heir apparent to McCarthy. But Scalise abandoned his bid on Thursday after it became clear he could not consolidate Republicans behind him. Without a speaker, the House is at a deadlock as war expands in the Middle East, Russia continues to pound Ukraine, and the U.S. government faces a November 17th partial shutdown deadline without additional funding from Congress. Australia has overwhelmingly rejected a plan to give greater political rights to indigenous people in a referendum. All six states voted no to a proposal to amend the constitution to recognize First Nations people and create a body for them to advise the government. Australia on Saturday decisively rejected a proposal to recognize indigenous people in the constitution in a major setback to the country's efforts for reconciliation with its first peoples. Australians had to vote yes or no in the referendum on the question of whether to alter the constitution to recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people through the creation of an Indigenous advisory body, the Voice to Parliament. Australia's Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese. At the outset, I want to say that while tonight's result is not one that I had hoped for, I absolutely respect the decision of the Australian people and the democratic process that has delivered it. Australian media projected that at least four states would vote against altering the 122-year-old constitution, including New South Wales, Tasmania, Queensland and South Australia. A successful referendum requires at least four of the six states to vote in favour, along with national majority. Because of Australia's time zones, Voting in Western Australia was still underway as it became clear the referendum was lost. Emotions ran high in the Yes campaign camp. Auntie Shirley Lomas is an Indigenous leader. I, I imagine today most of the visceral voters would have voted no. And that's because of an ingrained and deep-seated fear. And they wouldn't use their intellect to vote yes. Australia's Indigenous citizens, who make up 3.8% of the country's 26 million population, have inhabited the land for about 60,000 years, but are not mentioned in the constitution. They are, by most socio-economic measures, the most disadvantaged people in the country. Many Indigenous people favoured the change, but some said it was a distraction from achieving practical and positive outcomes. The political opposition has criticised the measure, saying it is divisive, would be ineffective and would slow government decision-making.
we have some good news for you. The time for robots to patrol our streets for the safety of humans is here. In Sanjon City, South Korea, there is a robot that walks anonymously while monitoring and detecting situations of danger or fire. This four-legged robot approaches with its headlight on. It discovers a man collapsed on the ground and sends live video footage to a nearby device. This artificial intelligence robot is in charge of patrolling the Kumgang Pedestrian Bridge in Sejong City. It can climb stairs, avoid obstacles in its way, and even find a charging station on its own. A thermal camera and a 360-degree camera have been added to the robot to increase functionality for detecting dangerous situations, including fires. The goal is to build a system where these AI robots send live surveillance footage to the Urban Integrated Information Center from where the city's CCTV network is controlled so that firefighters and police can respond quickly to any situation. Existing robots were focused on mobility and autonomous walking, but we've added a function that uses AI data to detect abnormal behaviors like people collapsing and report incidents to the Urban Integrated Information Center. Patrol robots have been on trial in some communities, but this is the first time that they've been operated by a local government. Sejong City plans to run trial operations this year and introduce additional robots next year after adjusting for any shortcomings. Understanding it as robots doing things humans can't do or things that are difficult for humans, I think this will play a role in reinforcing human duties while promoting safety. A world where artificial intelligence robots patrol for the safety of humans is no longer an image of the future, but a reality right now. Welcome back. Russian-Chinese foreign ministers praise the ties of Putin-Xi meeting. For more on that story and more, let's take it on the world in a minute. At the BRI Forum in Beijing, China, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov stated that China's Belt and Road Initiative was key to promoting cooperation in the Eurasia region. An Illinois man from USA was charged with hate crimes for stabbing a six-year-old Muslim boy to death and wounding his mother in an attack that targeted them for their religion. A court in India has freed two men who were on death row for the alleged rape and murder of 19 women and children in 2005. Azerbaijani President Ilham Aliyev raised a national flag in the capital of the former breakaway region of nargorno karabakh after the lightning military operation last month. The actress and Thai master entrepreneur Susan Sommers passed away at home while surrounded by her family in the early hours of Sunday, which was the eve of her 77th birthday. That is all we have for you on World News Tonight. If you miss any of today's programs, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. We're leaving you tonight in the USA as sky lovers marveled watching the sun forming a ring of fire around the moon in a rare solar eclipse. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.